The agenda to possess the nations continues unabated. Where are all the tears in the church? When we arrived in this church, we saw that when people were preaching, others responded in tears. It is not the preaching that we do in our generation. Because they have come with an open heart. They long for nothing but the Holy Spirit and Christ. And their mind is on eternity. This is the reason for unleashing the church with the mandate of carrying the gospel to the ends of the year. The grace of God also requires something from us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lust and then live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. Do not conform to the patterns of this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Anytime the soul is not put in check and the soul aligns itself with the body to fight against the spirit the person even though will be a christian but will be a carnal christian welcome to pentecost hour a platform for teaching training and unleashing the church to fulfill her mandate as salt and light in the world pentecost hour god's timely word to our dying world worthy is the land. Worthy is the Lamb, you are holy, yes you are holy, oh are you Lord God, oh Give him a wave offering. So oh. 
within us are. We bless your name, Jesus. We glorify you. We give you glory, Lord. As we Yes, we give you glory, Lord, as we are you, for you are lifted, lifted, come on, lifted, lifted, oh yes, you are, let it be the cry of your heart. Lift it one more time as a house. We give you glory, Lord, as we are Lamando Messiah Mahase. We give you glory, Lord. Oh, as we are. most grateful to the Lord God Almighty for his grace and what he's doing in his church and in this nation, particularly through the Pentecost Youth Ministry. I want to take this opportunity to thank our dear chairman, Apostle Eric Nyamiche, and the leadership of the church, and I also thank my beloved brother, Apostle Ebenezer Hagan, and the National Executive Committee members of the Youth Ministry and organizers of this particular conference. I'll be mandated to speak to the topic, the Christian Leadership Challenge in a Secular World. The Christian Leadership Challenge in a Secular World. This topic has been taken from the general one that we are using in this conference that is tomorrow today the place of young politician or leader in Ghana's moral vision and national development tomorrow today the place of the young politician leader in Ghana's moral vision and national development. And I must be frank that I like the first phrase, tomorrow 
today. Because that resonates very well with my personal philosophy. I always say that tomorrow begins today. So whatever we do today is a rehearsal of what will be tomorrow. In fact, before we perform, to become very good and experts in our various performances, we need to look back what happened tomorrow. We are a product of yesterday. So, and the way tomorrow is relative. Today is today. We get into tomorrow, then today becomes tomorrow's uh, yesterday's or tomorrow's yesterday, right? That's what I want to say. So definitely we will come out to perform. But before we come out to perform, what we do today matters where we will go tomorrow. So let's take note of that. So the place of young politician, leader, and Ghana's moral vision and national development agenda, we know that through this conference, God will help us to empower ourselves, inspire ourselves, and then also be agents of transformation. But just as I've already said, I'm speaking to the topic, the Christian leadership challenge in a secularized world. I want us to take scripture reading from three passages. Three passages. The first one is Psalm 138, 4, and 5. Psalm 138, 4, and 5. And as we read the scriptures, I want you to reflect on them because they carry the very core of the message and the purpose for which we have gathered here. I'm reading from the NIV. May all the kings of the earth praise you. Lord, when they hear what you have decreed, may they sing of the ways of the Lord. For the glory of the Lord is great. I've underlined some of them. May all the kings is underlined of the earth praise you. So this particular scripture tells us what is on the mind of God. God wants every leader, every king, every person in authority to praise him. So he says all the kings of the earth praise him. And this gives a lot of dimensions to our Christian journey. To praise God and to say, hallowed be thy name. Chama Nyamiche will always say that even the hands that you lift unto the Lord should be holy hands. So if God calls all the kings to praise him, what it means is that God wants all the kings to live by the precepts of scripture. That one is a very, very important, and I want you to take note of it. The second reading is Psalm 10, verse 4. From the NIV. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. This one also gives a description of another person which is going to be part of what we are presenting today. It's a description. The first one is a command that God gives for people in authority to recognize his supremacy and sovereignty and then praise him. And then the second one gives a description of somebody. Because remember, we are talking about a leading in a secularized world and those people who form the nucleus of the so secular society. This is how God defines, describes, and talks about them. In his pride, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. It is not that the wicked man doesn't need God, but it's because of pride. And pride is a, a, an element of ignorance. By God's grace, I've written a book remo removing the veil of ignorance. And one of the symptoms of ignorance is pride. Because at the end of the day, it is going to lead to destruction. But the person is ignoring that which will lead to his 
or her distraction. So, pride is a, a symptom of ignorance. And when you talk about ignorance, you are talking about lack of awareness. You are talking about ignoring a legitimate signal. And then also lack of knowledge. So the Bible tells us that for lack of knowledge, my people perish. And if you listen to that scripture very well, he says that for lack of knowledge, my people perish. We are all aware that God is a repository of grace. But now he's saying that my people perish. He didn't say that the devil's people perish. So if you preach on ignorance, it is not glorious. Even if you gain today, tomorrow, you will get to the perishing point. But he is saying that in his pride, the wicked man does not seek God. What it means is that he, he knows that there is God, but he has decided and deliberately ignored God. And meanwhile, ignoring is an act of ignorance. So definitely, that act of ignoring will definitely lead a person to a distraction point. So that is why we have a responsibility to ensure that people who have ignored God will repackage the message of the kingdom very well and then we bring those people to God. Because it is not the desire of God to see, to read that people are being perishing. No, that is not his desire. In fact, brothers and sisters, I want to say that, look, God is not against any government and God is not against any political party, but rather the attitude and the behavior of the people that constitute that government. So if we have a message and then we tell our message and communicate well and the people change their attitude, it means mission accomplish on our part. So, he said that these people, there is no room at all for God. That is what they have decided. I've told you that I'm reading three scriptures. So, the first one talks about the command that God gives to people in authority. And then the second one is talking about or describing people that live within the secular context. They have no room at all for God. So, what it means when they say that somebody doesn't have a room for somebody, what it means is that if you knock at the door and then he asks you that who is knocking, and then he says the coffee man is knocking, he say you don't have a place here, go away. So if you want to know what we call the secularized world, this is how the world is. And then the third scripture reading is taken from the Living Bible. It says that the wicked men, the wicked men, so proud and haughty, seem to think that God is dead. That is the living Bible. The wicked man, when they, they, they think that God is dead. God is dead. That rem reminds me of the various eras that we have gone through. We have gone through the, the, the pre-modern era, which was an era of dualism where people believe that there is God, there are also other gods. And then when we came to the modern era, the modern era talks about um, that is it has an era of objectivity and then they, they thought that to be objective is to align with philosophy and science and that was where they came out with another philosophy and theories that um, the, the demise of God the demise of God that's where they came out with it that the demise of God so when people's hearts become so corrupt, then they declare God dead. Meanwhile, to God is not dead. So by declaring that God is dead alone, it means that there is a corruption in society. In fact, brothers and sisters, we cannot be talking about theories and other issues without trying to draw people's attention to the basic principles that make God, God in our society. The moment God reigns, and God reigns in the hearts of people. People who understand what we call kingdom values and principles. This one is not to talk about someone who goes to church. So, Psalm 20 verse 4 is saying that this wicked, so proud and haughty, seem to think that God is dead. They wouldn't think of looking for him at all. So this one also gives a description. Then the last scripture reading is says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight 
is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he med meditates day and night. So this last um, scripture reading also gives a description of someone who thinks about God, someone who is a follower of God, someone who is a godly person. So putting it in the context of our discussion today, someone who is a godly leader, a godly public office holder, a godly uh, politician, or a godly security person, whatever. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. So that person will be part of the society, that person will be part of the team, that person will be part of that political party, that person will be part of that government, that person will be part of that institution, but the institutions a uh, secularized council. Because the secularized councils of the institution have no room for God. So when they meet, no room for God. Sometimes we even do meetings, no prayer. Because there is no room for God. Just recently, I think yesterday or so, I had a meeting, and it was an international meeting. Immediately, we zoom in, we log into the Zoom. Oh, then the person started talking. And then when we finish, so have you finished? He said, yes, we finished. Everybody can go. No opening prayer, no closing prayer. Secularized world does not have a room for God. But blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners. He doesn't even stand in the ways of the sinners. Nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight in, is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. So at our workplaces, it is expected of us that we will even have this kind of meditation and then we move on. Brothers and sisters, the objective of this presentation is to help Christian politicians and public office holders identify the interplay between Christian leadership based on um, God's kingdom uh, values and dynamics of secular society to equip young Christian politicians and public office holders to change the dynamics and fundamentals of socio-political and fundamentals of, um, yeah, to change the dynamics and fundamentals of socio-political developments of society with the values and principles of God's kingdom. Apostle Eric Nyameche is reflecting on what he said yesterday. I have accepted two for us this morning. There should be no church that is unconcerned about what happens in the world. The essence of the church is to drive out the darkness of a home in the world. And then the second one is, in our day, some people don't value God bless you because they don't think about the future. He said this, and all these are the secular, and then youth director apostle Ebenezer Hagan also said this, let us remember, true leadership is measured not by power, but by the positive impact we have on others' lives. And then he also said this again yesterday, our involvement in politics and leadership is crucial for addressing pressing issues such as educational reforms, economic growth, healthcare, access, and environmental sustainability, thus laying the foundation for a society built on inclusion and mutual respect. Brothers and sisters, secularism or secularization has always been part of human existence. And yet Jesus, three years of active physical ministry on earth, transformed his world. So when it comes to talking about when people are secular, people reject God, it was there before Jesus was born. But even when Jesus was born into that situation, Jesus was so blessed that he did not stand in the ways. He did not seek counsel of the wickedness and the secular ideologies and people with secular idiosyncrasies. He never even uh, sought their counsel. Jesus was Jesus. And he came with the message of the gospel. And the, 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 the message he came with and the assignment of the Father. Because when you read from John chapter 20 verse 21, he says that as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So the Father sent him and he came with a message. He was a messenger of the Father. He was God at the same time carrying the message of the Father. So there was no reason that uh, Pontius Pilate or um, whoever, Herod, 
and the people, the powerful people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, there was no reason that these people could contaminate the message that Jesus brought. Jesus brought the good news. So truly, truly, I say to you, so that truly message was the message Jesus Christ brought unto the world. I think you can applaud Jesus at this time. Jesus' ministry was full of actions embedded in God's kingdom values more than worse. His life and deeds were indispensable to the massive transformation we are witnessing in the world today. We are witnessing in the world today. Thus, to be a disciple of Christ is the most glorious choice in life. But modeling and sustaining that life in the secularized world needs divine grace. It's not as easy as we are saying. The Bible is referring to some people as wicked people, wicked men, and this. For me, I term it as physical demons. In the secularized world, there are physical demons. Those people, they are demons who have email addresses. They have WhatsApp. They have gadgets. You do meetings with them. They draw agenda to skew the agenda to suit what they think. They write proposals. They write it very well, and they speak very good English, but at the end of the day, they are physical demons. The spiritual demons, it's not difficult to destroy them or to, to ward them off. But the physical demon, you do meetings with them, you send email, he also replies. It takes grace for you to know what is on the mind of these people. May God have mercy on us. Christians can be well positioned to overcome the negative effects of secularization if they are grounded in God's word and keep gazing at Jesus as they model his life and ministry. The power of the gospel is the basis of paradigm shifts in human politics and the transformation of social values. Even how we should spend our resources. The rich fool story in the Bible uh, also is an example we can learn. So, coming back to um, maybe a brief exposition of the scriptures that we have read, which I've already talked about. The first one, Psalm 138, is talking about the command for all kings to honor the Lord. That is biblical leadership that he requires. And then the wicked rejects God in his ways. That is secular leadership. And then the proud and wicked man thinks God does not exist. That also is secular leadership. And then leaders who overcome the ungodly influence of secular leaders are blessed. So at the end of the day, if we are able to position ourselves very well that the word of God will have an impact on our lives, we will be blessed. In fact, Brothers and sisters, our source of blessing is not the corners that we, are going, we, we, we should cut. Because for us, we know that we have God. So, the biblical principle of assuming a public office or the biblical principle of nurturing and developing your political career is not to abuse someone to trend. It is not to abuse someone to trend. For us, the blessings of God come from God, but not using someone's neck and someone's shoulders as a ladder to suppress him so that you will sit up. If you do that, you may go there for you to be congratulated, but your conscience will tell you that you did not abide by biblical principles. Let us abide by biblical principles. God is enough to be able to bless us. God is enough. The ways of the, of the world could be something they call propaganda, could be something they call this, could be something they call lies and all these things and all that. But our ways is righteousness. Christian leader, leadership is simply the kind of leadership that models the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is ultimate example of a servant leader who sacrifices himself for his people and becomes the king of kings, ruling over the, the, the nations of the world. Jesus' reign as king is both political and theocratic. Jesus got involved with the real world. The role he plays in the real world is a political standard for his followers. What is the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ? He is blameless of sin. He ministered not only as the son of God, but also as a true ambassador of his father, he did good for people and transformed their lives. Now, let's look at some of the real challenges for uh, Christian, Christian 
Christians in leadership, for Christians in leadership, some of the real challenges that we'll be talking about. First of all, we have been talking about moral vision, uh, putting our moral compass. There is a concept we call um, moral core principle. Moral core principle. This moral core principle talks about combination of uh, God or having a mind about God in leadership, in life, and then also serving, serving God, serving yourself, and serving others. This is a principle. So, serving God, serving yourself, and serving others. So, if you look at the screen, you will see the diagram that is there. That, please, let's go to the diagram. Yes, good. So, you will see, serving God, serving self, and serving others. So if you are able to do all these three very well, then it means that you have a sense of the moral call. And I will explain. When you read the Bible, that is from Mark chapter 12, verses, verse 28 to 34, but we will not read or we'll just take an excerpt of it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God. So that gives us the first one on the tip of the, the diagram. And then the second one is, love your neighbor as yourself. So here you see your neighbor, that is others, and then yourself. So the Bible does not tell you that because of your love for other people, you should subject your, yourself to something else. No. God enjoins us to love ourselves. That is why you are not supposed to commit suicide. It doesn't matter what, uh, whatever that happens in your life. Because your life doesn't belong to you. And then you don't also do things to discredit the, the body. So the body matters so much. But at the same time, others also value. In the sight of God. And then serving God is also good. So, uh, a Christian leader or a Christian uh, worker, or a Christian politician, abides by the moral call principle. He is always, whatever that they are doing, whether it's uh, in, the, in the chamber of legislation, or whether the person is a judge or security officer, or any decision that they are making, he has it at the back of his or her mind that the God factor, myself, and others. So, the myself and others bring us to this principle of the golden rule. Do to others as you want others to do unto you. So, if we have that rule and then we enter into politics or public office or any leadership position with this kind of mindset, then definitely we have it all. The God factor, myself, and then others. And that is what society is all about. In fact, when you come to the Greek word politics, just last week, uh, this Sunday, I was having a session with the uh, Gaffes, the political chamber of Gaffes. And I was telling them that, you see, politics comes from the Greek word politica. And politica is to manage the affairs of the city. So the, 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 the politics, the, the police that is in it, comes from the Greek word city. The police. That's why we have metropolis, we have uh, Indianapolis, and the moment in the Greek, uh, this thing, you see that suffix, police, 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 then you are, it, it, it has to talk about either a community or people. So it is to govern people. So the original word of it has nothing to do with something that is like a deception, something so in Ghana uh, and some other places when we talk about politics, the first thing that comes to people's mind is uh, uh, then you have to be skillful in the way we deceive. Then, uh, hey, politics, that is, that is a concept. Then you have to have a banter with people. So on the TV always they say that so people are learning all these things. So the moment you just say that politics, then the person is arming his teeth and then flexing his muscles 
And they say now, if you are going, you have to be tough, you have to be strong, and then you go and fight. As for politics, it's fighting all. So he say, when I did it, when I was here, when I was here, when I made the buy, when I made the buy, so that is the kind of picture that we are portraying. But the original word and the concept of politics is not about deception. It's not. It's not about being a con man. It is not about uh, fighting somebody. It is to govern the affairs of the police. That is the city. It's very simple. So, brothers and sisters, I'm so happy that by Kanke Tessis of our dear youth director and his team, we have been brought together for us to go back, which Ghanaians will say that Sankofa, so that we go back to dig the original meanings of some of these things and then understand all the nuances so that we will be able to do it well. So if the world is failing, we should be able to correct it. And the person to correct it is you. Look, brothers and sisters, for me, I believe that we don't even need many people to change the dynamics of society. In this world, we, were, we have read that time I was not born. When one person developed his ideologies and then he was able to rally the whole world into a war. Adolf Hitler was able to rally the whole world into the, uh, to, to fight. My father's father was an army officer. He went to the war in Burma. And this man, now, those of you who are familiar with world history, you ask yourself that the Second World War, what actually were they fighting for? They didn't fight to take territories. They didn't fight to do anything. It is just one person who keeps on hammering one thing, hammering one thing, saying one thing. But at the end of the day, he has some people in mind that he wanted to annihilate them. And then this one joined. Then this one joined. So this one joined. So if we have one wicked person that was able to rally the whole world to fight a battle, then we should have one righteous man that will be able to rally a whole community to do the right thing. It's possible. It's possible. Hallelujah. So one of the worst challenges is the obligation to abide by the moral core principle in a secularized world as a leader. Because in the secularized world, the first one on the tip of the graph, which is the God factor, is not there. And then the last one, which is the seven others too, is also not there. It is only the self. It is only the self. So every agenda, every meeting, just as I was saying, they can write a proposal very well. But at the mind of the person, he knows that I'm going to serve myself. But initially, he say, oh, media muntiana yebre, especially you, the young people. It's because of you. It's because of you. Yebre, The self is in the center. But for you, moral core principle. Serving God in leadership, serving yourself, Seven others. Hallelujah. So, explaining this quickly, serving God and abiding by his principles in the perverse world. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 7 and 8 says that, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each of each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. That is the the first one, the first principle. Then the second one, ensuring the comfort of self against the backdrop of God's kingdom values and principles. And that one is the heart, that is James chapter seven, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the serving self also comes with vulnerability because of how the heart is. Then the last one, here on this series, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse, verse 3 to 5. Serving others and seeking their welfare in the face of evil orchestration and ungodly ploys. And that one, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the the others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So the understanding here is that you see, serving others also comes with its own peculiar challenges. Jesus came to serve and deliver the whole world, and Jesus was going around doing good and healing people. 
But when Jesus was arrested with a criminal, the same people say that they should crucify Jesus and leave the criminal for them. So I just want to have you have this picture so that you understand that serving others and then trying to seek the welfare of other people also comes with its own challenges. But be prepared. You are a follower of Christ. Jesus did, but at the end of the day, his name was exalted. So you may not take it so easy by serving people, but the Lord will bless you. So it is always, it is the God factor that will drive your conviction. Otherwise, the human factor will pull you down. Even as you do, then the human factor tends to pull you down. May God have mercy on us. Understanding secularization. Secularization is simply a separation between religious values and public life. It is also the concept of embracing every ideology and belief system without giving prominence to a specific religion. The center of gravity of secularization is secular humanism. And secular humanism is a different topic altogether. But I want to say that the adoption of secular humanism and some aspect of postmodern epistemology, bringing all of them together, these things tend to affect our mindset and then our total dependence on God. They tend to affect, because these are all concepts, the issue of subjectivity. Everybody will say that I have the truth. So if everybody is saying that I have the truth, then where is the objective truth that the Bible outlines? So here, we are living in a world that the meta-narratives of Scripture have been neglected. They don't, the, the, the Bible we read, it said that they do not even have a room for it at all. So when decisions are made, there is no biblical principle. So that is the challenge that we have. We have the real challenges. Maintaining integrity in the secular world is a problem. And then uh, navigating public spaces uh, with um, Christian, as Christian leaders is a problem. Then balancing compassion and conviction leading with love and understanding while remaining firm in Christian beliefs is a problem, is a challenge. The moral relativism is also a challenge. Secular ethics versus Christian morality. Because to some extent, it isn't everything that are Christian moral issues that are illegal in, by, uh, 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 by law. There are some things, law accepts them. But come into Christian ethics and morals, they are an affront to the tenets and principles of the Bible. The reason why law rejects them is that who made those laws? That one too is another discussion altogether. For us as Christians, we are favored by God to succeed. We are favored by God to succeed in life. We do not have to pursue success by abusing others to our advantage. I've already said it. So, brothers and sisters, young politicians, young public office holders, people who have been trained to take after our Lord Jesus Christ and pattern his principle, understand that Jesus is enough to bless you. Do not go and abuse someone to trend, to make yourself popular. Our God is enough to bless us. Our God is enough to expand our territory. Our God is enough to protect us. So, be careful about the ploys and schemes that the secular world have. This, today, by this presentation, we try to let you understand that there are two worlds running. There is a godly world and then the secular world. So the Bible says that we should not uh, resort to the counsel of the secular or the wicked people. That's why he puts it. The wicked people. So let's take note of that. Then now strategies. Quickly, building strong communities. The role of Christian leaders in fostering supportive and resilient faith community. We must have strong faith-based Communities. When we say faith-based communities, I'm not talking about uh, perhaps maybe going to have an estate or... Uh, uh, but what I'm talking about is we, we must have that fraternity. We must have that fraternity. When you go to Israel, they have this kibbutz system and they even use it for business and all that. So education engagement, advocating uh, for Christian values in educational settings and curricula as much as possible. Then leveraging media and technology, using modern platforms to spread Christian teachings and values in a secularized world. Because 
you should also bear in mind that these things that we are doing is not only about politics, politics, but we are talking about the secularized world versus the Christian uh, biblical principles, God's kingdom values and principles. So as we teach, then we cast our net widely, and then all people that have been trained will also, we will neutralize the secularization or secularism in society. And if we neutralize, yesterday the chairman was saying something that, look, Moses, Moses was a, was a leader. But the people, the people's behavior also affected his leadership. So if we train you alone and we don't have a platform where other people could also understand that Christian values must neutralize secularization, you will go there and these people will be giving you troubles. So it's a collective responsibility. We all take the message there and then we do. You go to a place even children who are going to write examination will go and put pressure on their teacher that they need a poor. And then they will go and tell the parents that uh, we need to pay money so that uh, we will go and then buy a poor or we will go and cut corners. And people finish school and then they get their certificate. Then the certificate alone is an uh, epitome of corruption. How did you get your certificate? When you were writing the examination, what did you do? And then when the nation is going wrong, then you come and say that, oh my, they are penny for no. Who got up on no penny being a tool for second? I got up on So we are all responsible. Everybody is responsible. Let us be part of it and then we fight this battle. It is not a time that we'll be pointing accusing fingers. But we know that because of the, the, the culture, the embedded culture in society. It, certain things are affecting us. In fact, when you, when you study anthropology, it will tell you that, you see, nobody, cultural issues are not genetic. Cultural issues are not genetic. We are encultured, depending on where you find yourself. Depending on where you find yourself. I remember when I came from Ukraine as a missionary and then came with my firstborn because I went with him. And in, in Ghana, when we came, someone would say that, oh, James, uh, he said, yeah, mama, I'm begging so. I'm begging you, sorry. No, I said, I'm begging you. I said, He doesn't even want to, to peace anywhere. Because of where, the, 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 he's a Ghanaian. But he, because culture is not genetic, the predominant culture around him influences his thought that a normal human being doesn't have to peace outside. But this child is doing it. But here you see Okwabrani himself. Ah, what do you know about Moa? What what your tourist attraction? Okwabrani himself. May God have mercy on us. So, engagement without compromise, influencing culture, influencing culture without compromising core Christian values, party politics with Christian values, influencing the partisan political arena with Christian values. Then assign young Christian politicians to career politicians and public office holders. I thank God that as we are here, we have our mother, Mama Gifty, and we have some of our big brothers like Professor Day and other people in society. So we need to be intentional about it. That we have groups that have been mentored by some of the career uh, public office holders, diplomats, politicians that we know that we have these cohorts that will come along with them. Then they will be intentionally mentoring them. When these people have certain questions on their mind, they will have someone to call. So that we don't, we don't resort our training to flamboyant conferences where people come and they will make presentations and at the end of the day then we are gone. So we want to first of all let us commend the youth director. Let's, let's, let's appreciate him. Yesterday, when Pastor Pascal was giving the presentation, he told us what we are going to do in the next two years. So this one is an engagement. It's not presentation. So at the end of the day, whatever that we are saying here, we are giving the concept. And then the concept will be followed through and through with what they said yesterday. So the Christian church should develop a strategic mentorship approach where young Christian politicians and leaders are assigned to career politicians, diplomats, etc., for mentorship in a stipulated period. I'm talking about the strategies. So the church, when I say the church, I'm talking about the church of God. 
should be intentional about this. So we call on all Christian churches so that they will, they will understand this principle. And then they know that for the Bible to uh, give us the biblical principles, we must not let them go. Dialogue and collaboration. Opportunities for Christian leaders to engage in interfaith dialogue and collaborative, uh, collaborate with secular leaders on common uh, causes. Witnessing through service, demonstrating uh, Christian values through acts of service and charity, making faith visible in um, action, influencing policy, advocating for policies that reflect Christian ethics in areas like human rights, justice, and family life. Uh, our dear brother, director, and then beloved brothers and sisters, here is very important. You see, we have quite a number of Christians in public offices. The person may be at a meeting, and then they will be discussing something that is trying to push God out of the room. And then he's there looking at them. He will not talk. He will not say anything. And then he's there looking at them. How many of us have even written articles to respond to a situation that tends to affect Christianity? We are all participant observers, but we are all silent. Who knows that it is because of times like this that the Lord has made you who you are. Speak out. God wants to hear your voice. Speak out. God wants to hear your voice. Those of you who know, in those days, since that happened and things that go on, I will quickly go and organize my article and then I will release it into the system. And sometimes when you are growing and you get to a certain level, then you become a bit discreet. But you people can take over. Mante Amen Kra. And no man no koso, na yomu lambasti ye ni ade, no biera ashe, no way in any. And when I look at it, I know what to write. But for some reasons, na ma ye di. Yami hu yamabo. William Wilberforce was a British politician and philanthropist who advocated for abolishing the slave trade, even though it was a lucrative business. That time to say that stop slave trade is like you are signing a, a, a death warrant. They will attack you. Because everybody was gaining. So who are you to come and tell us that we should stop like Galam say? And I read about him from Wikipedia. He says that William Wilberforce abolitionism was derived in part from evangelical Christianity to which he was converted and then he gave the date. His spiritual advisor became John Newton, a former slave trader who had repented and who had been the pastor of Wilberforce Church when he was a child. So this man gained from slave trade. His encounter with William Wilberforce made him to repent from this lucrative business. In 1787, Wilberforce helped to found a society for the reformation of manners. So, you see, when you study church history, there was a reformation, of course. The one that took place from 1517, when Martin Luther pasted the, the, his thesis on the uh, Wittenberg district. After that, the reformation continued. But the one that occurred in Britain was the, uh, later the reformation era. Then, the drive of the reformation. William Wilberforce saw that we have achieved the reformation, the real reformation, but we have not achieved reformation manners. So he wrote and then formed a society to look into reformation manners, which they did. That is called the proclamation of society to suppress the publication of obscenity. So he did not only champion, uh, uh, he not only champion. Uh, how do you call it, the slave trade, abolition of slave trade, but also he stood against publication of obscenity. What are you standing against? By God's grace, God has helped you. Some of us are from humble backgrounds. The Lord being aware of the kind of people he will raise to come and help society. So because of that, he took you through. 
You didn't die. Others are gone. You didn't die. You didn't drop off. At the time that you were supposed to drop off your education, somebody came. There was a divine intervention. You will now have your first degree. You now have your master's. You now have your PhD. For William Weber Force, this is what he uses. A little education he had to transform his world. What are you using your education for? To write examination and pass and have first class is not enough for God. God is not surprised about your first class. But what you use your education to do, that is what God is looking up, up to you. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter the number of congratulations we get in society. God is not surprised. You are on a mission. John 20, 21. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So we go because we are sent. So use what you have to do something. Your academic qualification is the Moses staff. There is a Red Sea. Everybody is running health as Kelta. But you use your qualification to part the Red Sea for others to walk through. So Martin Luther King Jr. also did very well. And then we have the laws and virtues. Um, that is the, the slave trade issue that I've talked about. People worked and abolished it. We can also do then quickly the way forward and recommendations. Intention, intentional ment mentorship. Deepen our commitment to intentional mentor, mentor of Christians to take public office. Call to action. Encourage Christians to venture into politics, public offices. Like Chairman was saying yesterday, the United Nations areas, African Union, Go and enter there and transform them. Diligence and boldness. We need diligence and boldness. Sometimes when you are dealing with the physical demons and you are not also so robust and you can't articulate yourself well and you can't face them with biblical principles, they will overwhelm you. So go receive that spirit and then go like the William Weber Force, like the Martin Luther King Jr. and like those people we have, Mama Gifty and co, other people that we have in our society so that you go and transform our society for us. Instill honesty and diligence, and then you go. Christian Public uh, Sectors Forum establish Christian unions and associations to promote kingdom values and principles among Christian workers in the former and non-former sectors. Pragmatic approach. A pragmatic approach should be taken to promote the uh, participation of Christians in active politics. For example, supporting aspiring politicians like members of parliament to pay for their initial expenses. It's not easy. We can say that they should go, they should go. And then you go, the money that you even use to register, the initial cost, it's not an easy one. We need to be intentional as to how. And then, uh, our dear director, one thing I want to say is that naming and honoring people who do good. Because, you see, the society is like that because of the pulling him down attitude, always, oh, naming and shaming, naming and shaming. Meanwhile, those people who are sacrificing their lives to do the right thing and they have become victims, we don't name and honor them. If we can fight corruption, if we can ward off moral decadence, we should learn to name and honor those people who stand with kingdom values and principles. <clears throat> Nobody is honoring them. We will teach all these things. He will go and implement it. And then they will come and pin him. And then he will stand. They will pin him. He will stand. And then the organization succeeds. That one, no honoring. No rewarding. May God have mercy. So naming on honoring. And then certain prayer force for our public office holders. They are suffering. So let us get prayer forces for them. Then we have a commitment. Finally, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20. That's my conclusion. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. All authority in heaven on an earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe what I have commanded you to do. I am with you from this time to the end of this age. The all authority in heaven on an earth have been given to me. Therefore, go implies that we have the power. We have the power. We are all commanders of our society. God has vested the powers in us. So, beloved, let's go and rule. 
Because that is what God has made us. May the Lord God Almighty bless you. May the Lord flourish your aspirations and ambitions. Whatever he has made you to be, may the Lord grant you grace. Amen.